Well, good morning. It's Monday morning and we continue on in Luke chapter 9 and we're reading the first 45 verses of uh, this chapter. And um, oh, this is such a great section. I want to say it's great because I think it's unreal and really real at the same time. And that's the kind of big aha moment I had as I was reading this chapter. Um, Luke chapter 9 is actually coming up to a really, really important pivot point in the book. Uh, chapter 9, verse 51, is uh, th- this little hinge. We talked about this in a sermon a few weeks ago, where Jesus will shift his focus into what is often called the travel narrative. From 951 onwards, he resolutely sets his face towards Jerusalem. And uh, increasingly, we're going to see less of what Jesus does and listen more to what he says. So you get the words of Jesus in the second half of Luke's gospel. And in the first part of the gospel, you get the deeds or the works of Jesus. And the ninth chapter is kind of like the um, the last sequence in this, the, 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 the final movements before the travel narratives begin. And it's an awesome set of sequences. Um, starts with the 12 disciples being sent out and they're equipped with Jesus' power and they are able to do what he can do. And it's incredible. Uh, they go out and we hear in verse six that they are proclaiming the good news like Jesus does. They're uh, speaking about that euangelion, the, the, the gospel news to people, and they're healing people everywhere. Just imagine that capacity. You think about what that would be like now if, if you had the capacity to heal everybody that you came in contact with. And that was the experience of the disciples. And they were able to say, this has come to you because the kingdom of God is breaking in and this is a kingdom you should be a part of. And they're proclaiming that good news. The news is so widespread that Herod, the Tetrarch, hears all about this and he wants to know well, what's going on. And, and then you have that astonishing scene where 5,000 men and then you add in the women and the children are fed with just five loaves and two fish. And you realize here's this one who is able to do miracles on the scale of creation, bringing something out of almost nothing and, and giving people all that they could possibly want, even so much so that there is more left over. Then you listen to Peter and he gives his announcement as to who Jesus is when Jesus questions. Kind of the same questions that Herod the Tetrarch was asking in the first part of the chapter in verse 7 now get echoed in verse um, 19 when the disciples reply when Jesus says, Who do people say that I am? And they say, Well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others say one of the prophets of long ago who's come back to life. But then he says, But you, who do you say that I am? And Peter says... You are God's Messiah. You're the Christ. You're this promised one that's to come. And at that point, Jesus then warns his disciples and goes into a section that I want to return back to. But notice that following on from that, eight days later, he's being transfigured and you have this incredible encounter that a few of the disciples witness as Jesus um, is, is there and shown for all of his glory and, and they hear a voice from heaven saying, this is my son, listen to him. Uh, on from that, you get another miracle event when Jesus casts out a demon that's uh, afflicted this boy. And then Jesus, for a second time in this chapter, predicts his death, which is what he had done back in the middle section. Uh, at the very end of that, this section, in verse 45, where today's reading ends, though, notice what happens. And this is where the unreal, all of those unreal events that we've just heard, become quite real. Because the kingdom of God does seem unreal, doesn't it? All of the sicknesses healed, demons dealt with, you've got feeding of the 5,000, you've got this incredible one transfigured before your very eyes. And that just seems all so out there and so hard to comprehend, so unreal. And yet then it becomes real when the disciples they discover that they really can't understand anything that's been going on. Um, Have a look at verse halfway through verse 43. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Now, there's lots of kind of thoughts about in what sense was it hidden from them? And I don't think it's saying that it was kind of a, 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 a restriction from God that he hadn't given them insight or that there was something demonic about this, that they weren't able to see it, but that they couldn't understand it. It was hidden. They didn't have the categories to understand what, what was taking place around them. And that is because 
because of what comes, I think, in the middle of this whole section. See, why don't they get it? Why is it so unreal to them, and yet they show that kind of reality of failing to understand? And I think it's to do with what Jesus says right in the middle of this section. Because Jesus starts in verse 22 and he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He's saying this is certainly going to happen. It must happen this way. This is the way that God has planned. And then what? He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. There must be a death and there must be this raising to life. Now, why? Well, it's all to do with the nature of his kingdom. That his kingdom is coming to deal with sin and with death and to bring people back into a relationship with God. And Jesus must die that sacrificial death. And he must rise again in order to demonstrate that he has the power over death. But it's all twisted upside down because that death looks like defeat, but it's really a victory. But notice how he goes on. In verse 23, he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. And what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. So you see the picture, don't you? Here is this strong call, this one who must die and must rise again, calls people to follow him in his kingdom, but they must also deny themselves, which is just, well, it's so unreal, isn't it? It's so hard to fathom. It's so flipped on its head because them like us live in a world where you don't deny yourself. In fact, you assert yourself and you demonstrate your strength and your power and your intellect. And yet we're shown at the end of this passage that they don't have the strength, the power and the intellect to even understand this kingdom. And so my prayer as I come to read Luke chapter 9 today is to think about whether or not I'm actually understanding, whether or not I see the unreal nature of God's kingdom, just how awesome it is to be part of that, this one who has the power to bring life and a kingdom that we long for, that that has no disease and isn't full of evil, and, and to see Jesus as he is transfigured, glorified, the one who died and has been raised and is living and reigning and ruling, and that I might live then in light of that as one of his disciples. And that's not triumphant kind of, you know, feeling all of the bravado. It's it's actually to deny, my, deny myself and to take up my cross and to think about what my sacrifice will look like in the love and the service of others. And that was the challenge for the disciples. Something that as you read on through Luke and Acts, you discover they discover as they're filled with the Spirit, that it's God's Spirit indwelling them that allows them to live exactly that existence, one of personal sacrifice and daily devotion where they choose uh, not to forfeit their soul, but in fact to live their lives not ashamed of Jesus, but standing up for and speaking out because they know the one who is glorious. And we know him too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. We thank you that it comes to uh, us at a time when we need to be reminded of the power of your kingdom and of who your son is. I pray, Lord, that we would have eyes to see Jesus today. And so, Lord, as we take up our cross today, seeking to follow you, that we might deny ourselves and live our lives in the service of the king of the eternal kingdom. And so, Heavenly Father, into a time where we need to be reminded of things that are lasting and fixed and powerful. We pray, Lord, that we would hold fast to your kingdom and to your king. And so we entrust ourselves into Jesus' hands today. And we do it in Jesus' name. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen.